The RTX 4090 was a highly anticipated graphics card from Nvidia. Many hardware enthusiasts want to get their hands on this GPU because of its blistering fast performance it has to offer. Here's a custom model from MSI known as their Gaming X Trio which I'll be doing a review of and comparing it against Nvidia's previous gen flagship. Does it live up to the hype? Well that's what we're here to find out. Hey if you enjoy content like this drop a like, make sure to subscribe and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey what is going on guys, Danny here, welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. Welcome to my review of the MSI RTX 4090 Gaming X Trio. I'm a bit late to the party with my review, had some stuff come up in between so I couldn't post my review when the embargo lifted. Nonetheless, I am quite excited to share all the benchmark results and data I've gathered from testing this graphics card, and I'm sure you guys are all quite interested in it as well. Now I have already done an unboxing and overview video of this card where I talk about its design and aesthetics, so if you're interested in that sort of info, link for it will be in the video description. Suffice it to say, I have no doubt that the model will be a popular choice amongst the rest of the AIB cards. While Nvidia's Founders Edition gets all the attention during launch, it's not the card that the vast majority of PC gamers and hardware enthusiasts will be buying. That's because the FE model is usually limited in supply and isn't available everywhere. Here in Canada, the FE model is only available at Best Buy and it was sold out instantly whereas custom models like this MSI Gaming X Trio are available at a wide variety of retailers and it has more stock available. Therefore, there will be many people out there who will be interested in knowing how this card performs. Now that's enough preamble, it's time we got this review underway. To start off, I just quickly wanted to go over some quick specifications of the MSI RTX 4090 Gaming X Trio graphics card. The RTX 4090 is powered by Nvidia's latest Ada Lovelace GPU microarchitecture and is based on the AD102 die, which is manufactured using TSMC's 4 nanometer process. This GPU has a die size of 608 millimeter square and is packing a whopping 16,384 CUDA cores, 512 texture mapping units, and has 176 render output units. The 4090 is also sporting 512 fourth generation tensor cores, which will be utilized when using DLSS technologies, and also third generation RT cores, which will provide an uplift when it comes to ray tracing. This GPU has a base clock of 2235MHz and a boost clock of 2595MHz, though if the boost behavior is anything like the previous generations, then this GPU should boost much further than that. Also the boost clock of 2595MHz is the same with both the silent and gaming BIOS. I will be testing this card using the gaming BIOS. Along with that, this GPU has a large memory buffer of 24GB of G6X memory, which runs at 21 gigabits per second, and utilizes a 384-bit memory bus. The GPU has a TDP of 450 watts, and I believe for this particular model, MSI recommends an 850 watt power supply. As for the test system specs, the CPU is an AMD Ryzen 7 5800X, which has been overclocked using PBO2 and Curve Optimizer, and is cooled by an Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 360 AIO, and is paired with 32GB of Patriot Viper Steel DDR4 memory, which is running at 3800 Mega Transfer CL14. The motherboard is an MSI X570 Unify. For our storage, we have a 2TB Samsung 970 EVO Plus NVMe SSD. Powering the entire system is an EVGA G3 1000 Watt 80 Plus Gold Certified Power Supply. The operating system installed was Windows 10 Pro, as that is what the vast majority of users are still on. If you're interested in full system specs, check the video description down below. Now that we've gotten specifications for the GPU and test system out of the way, it's time we finally jumped into the performance data and benchmarks. To begin with, I wanted to go over the frequency behavior of the MSI RTX 4090 Gaming X Trio, as this will help validate its boost specification and see what this particular card can do out of the box. Also, I know most of you guys are here for info on this card's characteristics rather than performance, as I'm assuming most of you have already seen day one reviews. Boost behavior for Nvidia GPUs these past few generations has been kind of boring. Most of the cards out of the box would boost to around 1800 to 1900 MHz, and it's been this way since the Pascal 10 series. With Ada Lovelace and the 4000 series, there is a significant bump in clock speed, and we can see that here. Stats like frequency behavior, thermals, and power were measured and recorded using hardware info, and the stats were recorded during a gameplay session of Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Time Spike Stream's second benchmark on loop for about an hour. 
In our Time Spy Extreme test, the 4090 out of the box averaged a boost frequency of 2700 MHz, but we can see it wasn't consistent. The clock speed was jumping between 2595 MHz to 2745 MHz. Compared to the Asus ROG Strix RTX 3090, that GPU attained an average core frequency of 1766 MHz, and it wasn't consistent either. Time Spy Extreme's second benchmark is quite heavy on GPUs, so I'm not surprised by this behavior. Still, it was great to see that for the most part, the 4090 was boosting above its advertised clock speed. Now, when we take a look at Shadow of the Tomb Raider, clock speed behavior was totally different. Here, the MSI 4090 Gaming X Trio averaged a boost frequency of 2744 MHz, and the graph shows us that at the beginning there was a bit of variance, but then it quickly settled at 2745 MHz and completely flatlined there. So much more consistent behavior in this scenario as opposed to a heavy graphic stress test. Moving on, and I wanted to take a look at thermals. This is definitely an important topic because it shows how the GPU handles heat dissipation during load. If the temps get too high, then that will negatively impact performance, as then the GPU will have to scale back its clock speeds. Now, I was seeing concerning comments online from people about this particular model, because there's no included vapor chamber that other brands and the FE model are utilizing. MSI does mention vapor chamber for their higher tier Supreme model, but nothing for this card. Well, I'm happy to report that temps under load for this card are actually quite good. During our Time Spy Extreme test, the GPU core averaged 66 degrees and peaked at 69 degrees. Nice. Our GPU memory also stayed at around 68 degrees Celsius and peaked at 70, which is excellent. It seems like memory cooling has also been taken seriously this generation as opposed to last gen. You can see the ASUS 3090 Strix has similar temps for the GPU core, but memory temps are significantly higher, and this was also the case for my 3080 which would reach 90C under load. Our hotspot temp wasn't that much higher either, we're looking at 75C, so just 9 degrees higher, and it peaked at 80 degrees Celsius. Our temperature over time graph gives us a better insight as to what happened during the test. We can see our GPU core temp and memory stayed in the mid to high 60s, while our hotspot temps hovered in the mid to high 70s. GPU fan speed was also around 1550 RPM, but these fans really aren't that loud. I'm not surprised though, because previous generation MSI cards have been stellar, and these Torx 5.0 fans are no exception. For a GPU that has a TDP rating of 450 watts, this large heatsink is sure doing a good job at taming the beast. Now, when it comes to gaming, things get a bit better. We dropped a degree for our average GPU core temp, but our memory temps did go up slightly, but it's still nothing to be concerned about. Our GPU hotspot temp also came down a bit, where now it averaged 73C and peaked at just 75C. Looking at our temperature over time graph, because the GPU was running a tad bit cooler, we can see the fan speeds have also come down a bit, staying around 1400 RPM. So overall, the cooling performance of this card out of the box is quite good. As long as your case has good airflow, you should be fine. Far too many times I've seen people complaining about high temps on their graphics card, only to find out that they have no airflow in their case. Let's take a look at power consumption. In our Time Spy Extreme test, the MSI RTX 4090 Gaming X Trio averaged 433 watts in terms of power consumption and peaked at 447. Power consumption here is considerably higher when compared to last gen, but as you guys can see from the performance numbers, you might be convinced that the trade-off is worth it. I am still impressed as to how cool the card ran despite this high power draw figure. When moving on to gaming, here we see something interesting happen. Now the RTX 4090 is only using 3 percent more power on average when compared to the RTX 4090. And this was at 4K by the way, so it's still quite an intensive load on the GPU. But what's interesting is that despite the lower power draw, GPU core frequency maintained was higher than what we saw in the Time Spy test. What this tells us is that this GPU is pretty smart at regulating power depending on the load. So in this gaming workload, for example, it doesn't necessarily need to draw as much power, and that helps with temps and boost figures. Alright, up next, we're going to be going through some synthetic GPU benchmarks and some productivity workloads. Keep in mind, for most of the benchmarks I'll be going through, I'll be mostly comparing the 4090 against the 3090 since that is a GPU that is most closely related from the previous generation. But other GPUs are there for your insight, and if there is anything worth mentioning, I'll definitely highlight it. The first benchmark we have is 3D Mark Fire Strike Ultra. Here the 4090 scores 24,597, which is 90% higher than what the 3090 scored, that is one heck of a performance uplift. Interestingly, AMD's RX 6800 XT does quite well in this benchmark too. Up next, we have Time Spy Extreme, and here the 4090 scores 19,288, which makes it 88% faster than the 3090. 
so the margin did close up a bit, but that's still one heck of a lead. Up next, we have Unigen Superposition using the 4K optimized preset. In this benchmark, the 4090 yields chart topping performance, scoring 33,231, making it 95% faster than the 3090. It will be interesting to see if we have these kinds of performance differences in games. Blender is a popular program used by artists, and it does leverage Nvidia's CUDA to accelerate workloads. In this benchmark, we measured samples per minute, and we can see the 4090 attained 2,893 samples per minute, which is just slightly over double the performance of the 3090. That is impeccable performance. V-Ray is another popular renderer used by artists to bring their images to life. This program can also utilize Nvidia's CUDA, and here we can see the 4090 is again over two times faster than the 3090 in this program. So for all you artists out there, Ada Lovelace seems to be an absolute workhorse of an architecture. However, it's not all good news. I thought I'd try some rendering tests using Vegas Pro 20, which is a very popular video editing software. In this benchmark, while the 4090 pulls ahead of the RTX 3090, it's not a huge margin, just a 12% drop in rendering times, but we can see Vegas Pro does favor AMD's VCE encoder as the 6800 XT is quite a bit ahead. Handbrake is next, and in this test, the 4090 does have the fastest transcoding times, but again, AMD's 6800 XT isn't too far behind. I feel like I probably should have used a larger and longer video file to see the differences highlighted more, rather than a short 3 minute gameplay. But all these GPUs would cut down rendering time significantly, as opposed to using CPU encoding. Geekbench 5 is next. The GPUs tested were using the CUDA benchmark, and here we can see the 4090 is ahead of the 3090 by a significant margin, 58%. This margin is then increased by a single percent when we take a look at the OpenCL data. While large margins, this benchmark shows that the 4090 and 3090 are relatively more closer than other tests. The last synthetic benchmark we're going to take a look at is Passmark's 3D graphics test. It's a bit of an outdated test, and we can clearly see that by the scores which are reflected here. The 4090 scored 39,661, making it just a mere 24% faster than the 3090. Alright, now it's time for the exciting portion of the review, the gaming benchmarks. I tested 12 games at 3 different resolutions, 1080p, 1440p, and 4K, using the ultra quality or very high presets. After conducting the gaming tests, I kind of regret testing at 1080p and wasting my time there, and you guys will see what I mean by that as we go through the benchmarks. First up, we have Total War Warhammer 3. This game is clearly more GPU bound than it is CPU bound, because even at this resolution, the 4090 is 38% faster when it comes to the average frame rate, though 1% lows seem quite a bit low. But at 1440p, the margin grows to 60%, so even though there was a significant difference, clearly there was a CPU bottleneck at play there. Then at 4K, the 4090 maintains that same margin of being 60% faster than the 3090. Though it's interesting to see the 1% lows are higher than the average frame rate of the 3090, ensuring a much smoother experience at this demanding resolution. The next game we have is Forza Horizon 5, one of my favorite titles, and an absolutely gorgeous open world racing title. This is another title that is more still GPU bound, as we can see at 1080p there is a considerable margin between the 4090 and 3090 at 42%. At 1440p, we can see performance drop a bit for all GPUs, but it's not that much. We're looking at about a 10 or so FPS drop for the average frame rates. The 4090 still maintains a really strong performance lead and extends it to 47%. Then at 4K, we can clearly see the 4090 flex its muscles, where now it's a whopping 72% faster than the RTX 3090, and we're basically maxed out here. Forza Horizon 5 is one of my favorite titles that I like to play on my 4K OLED, and I can't wait to try it out with my 4090. Up next, we have Hitman 3, and at 1080p, we're clearly running into a severe bottleneck. The 5800X is not fast enough for it, so let's try 1440p. Here we can see things kind of start to fall back into the realm of normality, but as the 4090 is just 4% faster than the 3090. Add 4K and now we're able to take advantage of the 4090 where it's 45% faster than the 3090 when it comes to the average frame rate. 1% lows are still not great, but this game had stuttering issues with all the GPUs I tested, so more optimization is needed there. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is about 4 years old at this point, but the reason why I like to include this title is because it's really well optimized and it's still getting updates. Recently they added Intel's upscaling tech to it. At 1080p we have a 47% lead that the 4090 is holding 
over the 3090, but a mere 10% difference when it comes to the 1% lows. At 1440p, while the 3090, 6800 XT, and 3080 are still providing respectable figures, the 4090 is just in a class of its own, extending its lead to 69% over the 3090. Then at 4K, we can see those GPUs take a pretty severe hit to their performance, but would still provide a smooth experience. The 4090 is still putting up some ridiculously fast performance in this title at 4K. It's just in a league of its own. Red Dead Redemption 2 is another open world title, it's been on the older side as well, but still looks fantastic and is highly worth checking out in my opinion. At 1080p, the 4090 attains an average FPS of 190 frames per second and 103 FPS for its 1% lows, a 30% lead over the 3090. Then at 1440p, we can see that lead jump to 50%, barely having its average frame rate affected and maintains the same for the 1% lows. At 4K, I was expecting the lead to grow by another significant margin, but instead we're looking at a 56% lead that the 4090 has over the 3090. Still, it's great to see a GPU offering triple digit performance at 4K in this title. Assassin's Creed Valhalla seems to favor Radeon GPUs. Here the 6800 XT is the second best card, but still falls quite a bit behind compared to the 4090 where there is a 38% margin at 1080p. Then at 1440p, the 3090 and 6800 XT are more or less tied, but the 4090 is 60% ahead of the former. Interestingly, at 4K, the margins close up a bit, where now the 4090 is 56% faster. Still, the experience the 4090 would offer in this title over the rest would be far superior, where those cards just average around 60 FPS, and their 1% low figures are below 50. Also, I know it looks comical having the 3050 alongside all of these cards. I just threw that in there in case someone was upgrading from a lower end or entry level GPU. Far Cry 6 is another Ubisoft title. 1080p, we're not even going to bother with that. And at 1440p, it's still Bottleneck City. At 4K is where we start to see the 4090 finally get utilized, where now it's 40% faster than the 3090. The 1% lows, however, are terrible. Not sure if it's an issue with this specific game or if there's some kind of slowdown from the CPU, but there would be too much variance in performance, so even though we average 115 FPS, it wouldn't feel as smooth as the figures imply. But, you know, what else can you expect from a Ubisoft title? Next up, we have Cyberpunk 2077. It's hard to believe that this game is almost two years old at this point, and well, that might also be because Nvidia is still using this title to market their newest graphics card. Nonetheless, it's a great looking game, they've been making improvements with patches, and that Cyberpunk anime, wow, what an amazing show that was, came out of nowhere and absolutely blew me away. Highly recommend checking it out if you haven't already. Going back to the topic on hand, at 1080p, we're a bit CPU limited, as the 4090 is only about 20% faster, and the 1% lows are around the same as the 3090. At 1440p, that lead grows to a staggering 58%, while our 1% lows remain unchanged. Once we bump up the resolution to 4K, this is really the first title we've seen that makes the 4090 struggle a bit. While it averaged 75 frames per second for the average frame rate, our 1% lows are at 51. This would still provide you with a totally playable experience, as it's also 63% faster than the 3090. Gears 5 shows us that at 1080p, we're quite CPU limited. At 1440p, the 4090 attains 159 FPS average, but it's only 26% faster than the 3090. At 4K is where that margin grows significantly to 50% between the averages for the 4090 and 3090. Control is another title that shows decent GPU scaling, as even at 1080p we can see there's a 31% lead that the 4090 holds over the 3090. Bumping up the resolution to 1440p allows us to see that margin grow to 69%, so that's quite a leap. Then at 4K, the 4090 increases that lead to 71% and attains 130 FPS average, while the 3090 just sits above that 60 FPS mark. This is a game that I feel like I'll probably revisit on that OLED. Horizon Zero Dawn is another fantastic open world title that I recommend checking out. At 1080p, none of the GPUs seem to be struggling with this resolution, and we can see the 4090 just chilling at the top, holding a 25% lead over the 3090 when it comes to the average FPS. 1% lows are quite a bit higher at 32% too. Then at 1440p, performance barely dropped for the 4090, indicating it was bottlenecked by the 5800X at 1080p. At 1440p, the lead for the 4090 has grown to 41%. Then at 4K, while the 4090 does experience a pretty significant drop in performance, it's still providing the user with an exceptional experience, along with that it's also 57% faster than the 3090. 
The last game we're going to take a look at is Doom Eternal, and this game is known as being incredibly well optimized. We can see that here. At 1080p, all GPUs put up excellent figures, but the 4090 is just in its own territory at 541 FPS average. At 1440p, performance barely drops, meaning we were actually CPU bottlenecked at 1080p, and the 4090 is also 66% faster than the 3090, though I'm sure nobody would be complaining about getting th over 300 FPS in this title. At 4K, all the GPUs still provide a buttery smooth experience. Nonetheless, it's still impressive to see the 4090 deliver an average FPS of 321 frames per second, but the difference between the 4090 and 3090 is still the same as what we saw at 1440p. Moving on to our 12 game average, and at 1080p we can see that even at the CPU bound resolution, the 4090 was 27% faster than the 3090. At 1440p, the lead for the 4090 gets extended to 48%, but the 3090, 6800 XT, and 3080 are all still able to provide a fantastic experience at this resolution. More on that later. And finally, at 4K is where we see the 4090's true advantage, holding a lead of 62% over the RTX 3090. This GPU provided us with excellent performance and this graphically demanding resolution. While there were some titles where the 3090 could deliver a playable experience, you're at that point where you'd still have to make some compromises in the settings menu or perhaps turn on DLSS. However, for the 4090, 4K is no sweat. You can pretty much crank up the settings, throw anything at it, and it will handle it like a champ. Before we get into the conclusive thoughts, let's take a look at ray tracing performance. While ray tracing is quite taxing on performance, even for higher end GPUs from the Ampere lineup, the 4090 shows us it might be the first time now where you can comfortably turn on ray tracing and not have to worry about going into the world of unplayability. But first, a couple of synthetic benchmarks. 3D Mark has a ray tracing benchmark known as Port Royal. In this benchmark, the 4090 is a whopping 88% faster than the 3090. V-Ray RTX is another benchmark I wanted to take a look at, and in this workload, the 4090 is a staggering 102% faster than the 3090, but we've seen how big differences in synthetic workloads don't always translate directly to real-world performance. So how about we take a look at some games? The first title we're going to take a look at is Cyberpunk 2077. It's basically the game that put ray tracing on the map. I also tested DLSS performance while I was at it so we can see if there was any sort of major improvement there. And for all the titles tested, I opted to use the balanced option. 4K was also chosen for this segment. In Cyberpunk, the 4090 is 31% faster when using DLSS. When we take a look at ray tracing performance by itself, the 4090 is 95% faster than the 3090, but the 4090 is also struggling offering a console-like performance at best. Even when both GPUs are using DLSS alongside ray tracing, there is a massive 85% difference and now the 4090 will offer you a smooth experience while the 3090 is struggling quite a bit. Control is another title that I think looks fantastic with ray tracing. We didn't necessarily need DLSS for the 4090 in this title, but hey, if you're just after some high frame rates, you can see a performance uplift of around 58%, which isn't bad at all. With ray tracing turned on, the 4090 is still able to deliver a fairly smooth experience at 68 FPS average, and that is a 70% lead over the 3090. But this game does have some fast paced action, so the higher frame rate could be advantageous, and using DLSS brings us back to the experience we got with Native. Hitman 3 is the first Hitman title to have ray tracing and DLSS included, and interestingly, DLSS does absolutely nothing for the 4090. We're actually running into a CPU bottleneck, that's why, and even though we're technically at 4K, it's kind of astonishing to see that. With ray tracing turned on, performance drops drastically to 57 FPS average. Playable, but it can be better with DLSS, and now we're looking at a smoother experience. We're also looking at a 75% difference with DLSS and RTX on when compared to the RTX 3090. Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition is a game that has ray tracing turned on by default, so I don't have non-RTX results. Looking at ray tracing performance by itself, the 3090 needs DLSS, as the 4090 is a whopping 87% faster. Then with DLSS, the margins decrease, but the 4090 is still ahead by 70%. In F1 2022, we can see the 4090 is having absolutely no issues at all producing frame rates north of 200 at 4K and showing 80% faster performance. DLSS isn't really necessary at all, but it's there in case someone was wondering. 
The ray tracing in this game is quite heavy though, because without DLSS, the 4090 only averages 72 FPS, which isn't bad, but the 3090 is struggling at 38 FPS, meaning the 4090 is 90% faster. With DLSS enabled, both GPUs get a nice boost in performance, but the 4090 still holds a commanding lead of 74% over the 3090. Clearly, when it comes to ray tracing performance, Nvidia has taken a massive stride over the previous generation and PR architecture. On that note, we might as well move on to our conclusive thoughts. I am absolutely blown away by the RTX 4090. This graphics card is a 4K gaming monster. For quite some time now, I had been waiting for either Nvidia or AMD to release a card that could game at 4K with no compromises, but along with that, push high frame rates, and the 4090 sure does deliver. There were a few exceptions, but for the most part, this GPU averaged performance in the triple digits at 4K. No other GPU up until now could do that without, you know, using upscaling. However, this is the GPU's biggest caveat. I feel like at resolutions lower than 4K or ultra-wide quad HD, this card is wasted. I mean, if you're someone who owns a 240Hz 1440p monitor, I can see you having somewhat of a case there, but chances are the games you're probably playing at that refresh rate are what? CSGO? Overwatch? Rainbow Six? Games that even the vanilla 3090 would have no issues handling. At 1080p, and you're literally burning money. Do not buy this card for 1080p gaming. There's no CPU on the planet right now that can handle this card at 1080p, and probably won't be for a while. But if you're someone like me, who has a 4K 120Hz OLED, and you want to run the latest and greatest titles at 4K maxed out with ray tracing, this is where the 4090 truly shines, especially when it comes to ray tracing performance. But aside from that scenario, I can't really think of why you would want to pay this much money for the 4090. You're much better off getting a discounted last generation RTX 30 series or RX 6000 GPUs. If you don't care about ray tracing or DLSS, then AMD is the way to go there. You know it's a shame that Nvidia made such a marvelous graphics card, but it's been released at a price point that is just out of reach for the vast majority of gamers. We finally got a graphics card released that can handle 4K with no sweat, and finally incentivize gamers to be able to enjoy ray tracing without having to worry about putting up with a slideshow of a frame rate. And it just pains me to say this, but the situation once the 4080 releases is not going to get better. Nvidia knew what they were doing this time around. They took the feedback from the previous gen where everyone was like, forget the 3090, buy the 3080. Now it seems like the opposite is true where everyone will say, forget about the 4080, just get a 4090 or stick with last gen. We can't also forget about pricing. This particular model over at Newegg retails for $16.49, but in other parts of the world where the currency is lowering in value, it's probably a lot more expensive. I mean, not too long ago, $1,600 would allow you to build a fairly high-end PC, and now we're talking about a single component. And that's the issue that I'm having. It's that there always used to be a much more affordable alternative to the flagship around $700 or $800. Before it was like, you know, if you're a hardcore fanboy, if you need all that VRAM, you know, get the flagship. But other than that, for everyone else, you can buy that $600, $700 uh, variant. A $1,200 4080, I'm afraid, isn't it. But circling back to the 4090, yes, it's expensive, and that makes it a tough pill to swallow, but it's only $100 more than what 3090 initially launched for, and this time around, we're seeing a massive performance uplift over last gen. As for the card itself, I think MSI have done a fantastic job with this Gaming X Trio version. As I was testing it for various games, I never noticed any issues in terms of temps or noise levels. Those were all totally acceptable. So for all of you guys out there who are shopping for an aftermarket model, at this point you're probably looking to get your hands on whatever is available, then don't hesitate on picking up this card because it's great. That will conclude my review for the RTX 4090 Gaming X Trio. But definitely stick around, I've got plenty of follow-up content planned since there were a lot of topics I couldn't touch upon in my review due to time constraints. I'll be looking at stuff like overclocking, undervolting, we're also not done with that 3090s, I'm thinking about doing a large 30 or 40 game head-to-head -head benchmark, and there is some other content that I want to be exploring with the 4090, so stay tuned for that. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.